Monday Night Football from Giant Stadium, the Meadowlands of East Rutherford, New Jersey. The Cowboys and the Giants will get you ready and talk about the NFL. Coming up. With Sterling Sharp and Joe Theismann, who promised not to sing, and to be joined by Ron Jaworski and Chris Mortensen momentarily, I'm Mike Tirico. Welcome to NFL Prime Monday. As you two amuse yourself, I'll tell everyone that week one of the season ends with the start of year 26 for Monday Night Football. And for a record 10th time, the Dallas Cowboys open on a Monday night, looking to join the 70 through 73 Cowboys as the only NFC team since the merger to make four straight conference title games. They open at their longtime rival, the Giants, and Leslie Visser is live joining us from the Meadowlands. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Mike. It's a glorious night here in the Meadowlands, and the forecast is clear. Whoever wins this game can take charge of the NFC East. I'm with a former Cowboy Dan Reeves and a current Cowboy Barry Switzer. Welcome, gentlemen. Dan, first you, you had something like 27 injuries in the preseason. Are you ready to take on the Dallas Cowboys? Well, we're a lot healthier now than we were during the preseason. Uh, we don't have a lot of confidence offensively going into the season, but, you know, hopefully we'll gain some tonight. Emmett Smith has gained something like 150 yards. I know. Don't want to hear about it. the last few games against you. What can be done against him? Well, you just got a gang tackle. I mean, Emmett's an unusual athlete. He's always played well in big games, and uh, we realize that. We just got to try to swarm the ball as much as we can. Well, Barry, they were sort of the Grinch that stole Christmas for you guys last year, although some people didn't think it was that important a game for the Cowboys. But what do you expect tonight? Well, I hopefully we brought the same team that played them when we played in Texas Stadium. <laughs> That's what I challenged our football team to do. I was kind of disappointed. I, I found out in my rookie year in professional football, Dan, that there is a difference when the playoffs are made and the emotion and intensity that goes into football. The season so long, and uh, hopefully uh, the, it, they play well, we play well, and uh, the team makes the fewest mistakes, probably win the thing. That's the way it will work out. You lost 10 free agents, three significant players. Are you a better team this year? I, I really think we are. I think that Alvin Harper is someone we miss that's a big play guy, but I think we're better. At, 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 I think Stepnoski has been replaced with Ray Donaldson. I, we're really pleased with him. Uh, Brock Marion's played well at safety, and, and the other guys were second teamers or backup guys. But I think that the, we've played well in spree season we're gonna find out a lot about our team tonight and don't forget Eric Williams Michael Irvin told me Eric Williams is the best player in the NFL he said not at his position he said in the NFL well that's a, a hefty compliment uh, I believe in Eric is a, a really a great player we're gonna find out about him tonight he's played well in the preseason game but uh, this will be the true test for him tonight and if he's well we're gonna be better in the offensive line than we were a year ago what about for you Jerry Jones has said you are his coach this year next year and possibly beyond but as we all know Jimmy Johnson had five years left on his contract contract and he's no longer there what makes you think you don't have to win the Super Bowl to keep your job well I, I don't worry about that Jerry has to handle that you know and and I believe in Jerry Jerry believes in me and we've got a great relationship and compatible and and I think that I believe in the guy and I think he believes in me and that's all I can say to you well this is a wonderful rivalry thank you both for joining us back to you Mike Leslie coaches thank you Joe and Sterling, hey, we've talked so much in the preseason about the Cowboys. I'm sure they have to be very anxious, Joe, because now they have to back up everything they've said during the summer. Well, Michael, not only the preseason, but the offseason has been nothing but constant conversation about the Dallas Cowboys. They went through all the what-ifs regarding the NFC Championship game. What if Barry didn't bump the official? What if they didn't score, the uh, 49ers didn't score 21 points in the first eight minutes of the game? All those what-ifs are behind them now. This is a hungry football team, Sterling. They're coming into this this game in the same situation the 49ers Niners were a year ago. Yeah, but I think the Giants also look at this as a game that they're the third or fourth best team in their division right now. Everybody's talking about the Philly West Coast offense, and everybody's talking about Dallas and, and Arizona. Where Arizona losing yesterday, here's an opportunity for the Giants to really make up some ground and say that, wait a minute, you know, we still got a nice running game, we've got a good defense, good young defense, and Mike, I think they're going to be the deal with tonight. That's right, so what you guys think. Let's turn to Ron Jaworski, who joins us every week from NFL Films. Ron, your first thought on the Giants and Cowboys. Boys. Well, I think the Giants can have a very good football team. When you look at uh, what Dan Reeves predicted uh, in this preseason, that they would go 11-5, and five, you know, that, that's pretty outspoken for Dan Reeves. But it's going to start with the quarterback, Dave Brown. Last year after he was benched, he came back and played very well. He's got to go to an, a, another level when we start this regular season, which is tonight, because he's got to make big plays. In Dan Reeves' system, it's basically conservative, run the football. But Dan does a great job creating gimmick plays and getting people open. And if they're going to be successful, they're have to score points with those gimmick plays, and Dave Brown's going to have to score the touchdowns off those gimmick plays. Mike? Brown suffered a concussion in the Giants' last preseason game against Carolina. Tonight's other quarterback is making, making news already. Let's bring in Chris Mortensen. Mort, 
Troy Aikman, now the, I guess, latest contributor to the Dion Fund. Yeah, and guess what, Mike? Troy is not going to play for free. <laughs> Uh, but Troy has agreed to free up about $2.5 million in salary cap money, and that's a significant amount. It allows a lot of flexibility for a deal that I think would make Dion the highest non-quarterback in this league, highest paid non-quarterback in this league. You know, anywhere is ranging from a five-year deal, around $25 million. Now, a lot's been said. Dion does want to make this decision this week, but Eugene Parker, his agent, says that report about a Sega Genesis deadline, it's a non-issue. He'd never heard about it. And in fact, on Thursday, Dion is off on Thursday with the baseball team. Dion would like to look at all the contract offers. He wants to make a decision because of his deadline. Well, Mort, there's a buzz at the stadium that Jerry Jones is up to something else that's also big. What may that be? Well, I talked to Jerry about midnight last night, Mike, and he would not detail it for me, but he admitted he was at gut check time is what he called it. That, uh, in fact, he called it a bomb. And, a lot's been talked about his deal with Nike, which would break ranks with the league on their sideline apparel deal, that maybe they won't do anything in the first half, but come out in the second half in terms of doing something with Nike. He's got something else going with an American Express. The league has a deal with Visa. What he is, in, what he is doing here, Mike, he's building up a lot of cash to pay a lot of money to a lot of players, and he's also inviting a lawsuit from the NFL because he doesn't think the league's deal with NFL properties would hold up in court. There's some other owners who agree with him, but I think we're going to see a lot of a uh, lot of news on this, Mike. He told us here last week that he feels the league can do business differently and not hurt the small market teams. Well, there's a buzz at Giant Stadium. Let's go back to Giant Stadium now. Leslie Visser, what does Jerry Jones have to say about all this? Well, Mike, Mort is correct. In the early 1960s, Pete Rozelle formed NFL Properties, which assigned the trademarks of the clubs to be marketed nationally by the league. But in the last 30 years, Jerry Jones, I just spoke with him a little while ago, he thinks things have changed. I think the league would like to assign clubs the manufacturers of the merchandise that they display on the sidelines, and we disagree. That's the club's prerogative, and each club should decide that. And so uh, it's a disagreement that we've had for quite some time, so it's not new for Monday Night Football. Jerry says he is not opposed to revenue sharing. He just doesn't see why all the success of the Dallas Cowboys in merchandising their properties should be shared, let's say, by the Cincinnati Bengals. He thinks it should be an incentive-based uh, deal where somebody like the Bengals would work a little harder to merchandise, to merchandise their product. But so far, Mort and Mike, the league doesn't agree. The, on the field in terms of players and logos and everything else, this is becoming more of a business, isn't it? All right, we'll talk plenty more about this game coming up in a little bit. First, some more of today's news, and it is the worst possible news in Pittsburgh. The residue of defeating Detroit by three, the leader on offense and the leader on defense will miss significant time. Mark Malone is in Pittsburgh to update the injury status of cornerback Rod Woodson and quarterback Neil O'Donnell. My quarterback, Neil O'Donnell, underwent surgery this morning about 10.30 to have two small screws inserted into his throwing hand about right here. The fracture was on an angle and therefore would not remain in place without the surgery. I just know that the surgery did go very well and that uh, should be able to start throwing in three weeks. So hopefully by the fourth game, um, he should be uh, available. That leaves backup quarterback Mike Tomczak to pick up the pieces. Himself hurt in the fourth quarter on Sunday with this vicious hit by Tracy Scroggins. My hit was legit. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to have to get just one of those airbags, you know? I wish you could get an airbag. Tomczak underwent further testing this morning, which confirmed no fractures. I'm not going to shy away from the opportunity because it's a good opportunity for me. And let's hope Neil gets healthy pretty quick because, uh, you know, this team I know is a lot better with uh, three healthy quarterbacks opposed to two right now. But Pittsburgh's worst fear was confirmed today when MRI test on Rod Woodson's right knee showed a complete tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. Woodson is expected to undergo reconstructive surgery within the next week. The Steelers are holding out hope he may return by the playoffs. But more likely, Woodson is done for the year. Just the turf. Turf caught the foot. And uh, when it caught the foot, you know, you know, my knee kept going. If the leg can't come back, you can't come back. But I think if a person has a true desire to come back, uh, they're going to come back. And I know, you know, I'm going to have all the doubters in the world because I'll be 31 next year and all that crap. But, uh, you know, so be it. Cowher said that the team is looking at available corners, but insisted that the players they have must step up and fill the voids. Reporting from Pittsburgh, I'm Mark Malone. Now let's send it back to the studio. Mike? 
Mark, we'll talk about those players a little bit more in a second. Let's show everyone if they're going to be without O'Donnell four, maybe five weeks. What's coming up in the next four or five weeks? You see three significant games against teams that made the playoffs last year and a road game at the Astrodome coming up on Sunday. Sterling, let me turn to you. We talk about missing Rod Woodson and cornerbacks. Chris Oldham and Alvoid Mays are the two cornerbacks that are there. Dion Figures is not 100% yet. Where will it have the biggest effect on the Steeler defense? Well, this guy's the best cover guy in the AFC. I don't know about the NFL, but he's certainly the best in the AFC. But here is where they're going to miss Rod Woodson. They're going to miss his ability to come up and support the run. I mean, that defense with all the blitzing and backs trying to get outside, he's an expert tackler. He brings a lot of force when he hits. He's also great on the blitzes. And, Mike, I think that's where it's going to hurt him. Hopefully they can get a... Uh, Deion figures back very, very soon. All right, that's the defensive injury. Now on offense, Joe, I, all, both of you guys, every NFL player has played through more than a broken pinky, but show me the significance of that injury to a quarterback. Well, you'd like to think that you can mentally play through a broken pinky, and you can, except mechanically you can't throw the football. For example, as I place my hand on the ball, you'll see that my pinky is located on about the fifth lace, and it's one of the things that grips the football. If that pinky is not there, that ball will come out end over end. Therefore, you have a problem just mechanically throwing the football. So the pinky doesn't seem like a lot when it comes to pain, but it's certainly a lot when it comes to mechanics, Mike. Boy, and they are lucky. One of the few teams that kept four quarterbacks on their roster. They have Jim Miller, a backup who they are somewhat comfortable with. Another AFC team has an injury problem tonight. It wasn't until about four hours ago that Denver found out about an injury to Michael Dean Perry. The defensive lineman injured his knee during a great debut. He hit the Buffalo quarterback eight times last night. Well, the former Cleveland Brown will have an MRI tomorrow to repair cartilage. The estimate anywhere from three to 12 weeks out. The Broncos go to Dallas next week. Later, we will talk more Cowboys. Will they miss Alvin Harper? And what the Dallas defense has in common with the 49ers offense. Also ahead, speaking of the Niners offense, Ricky Waters. His debut in Philly. Oof. You gotta hear what Ricky said yesterday. Steve Young, how's he feeling the day after a hit that scared him? And Troy Aikman. He will talk concussions, dating rumors, and a different approach to the 95 season. All that, much more as Prime Monday continues. We're proud. Well, this is it. Ooh, what a dump. Don't worry. Today he's sore, but okay as the 49ers QB gets ready for a second straight divisional game against Atlanta on Sunday. That not the case for Heath Schuler. The Redskins QB is out two to four weeks. Clyde Simmons providing the grade one shoulder sprain yesterday. Gus Farratt, the winner in relief, is now the starter. The Oilers' Chris Chandler, who left after halftime with a bruised shoulder after a negative MRI today. Chandler is expected to practice on Wednesday and play for the Oilers on Sunday. Cincinnati's defensive back said they intercepted Craig Erickson three times because he has a habit of locking on his receiver, as he does right here. He was pulled. Jim Harbaugh rallied to tie, but the Bengals went on to win the game. So a lot of dicey quarterback situations. We bring back Chris Mortensen. Mort, cover the QB situations in Indy and Washington for us. Well, Ted Marchabrota says today that he is sticking with Craig Erickson. They gave up a number one pick next year for him, Mike. They're, they're just not ready to panic on him. Although, owner Bob Ursay, who, who was not in Harbaugh's corner last year, now wants Harbaugh to be the quarterback. Keep an eye on that one. That's the type of situation that can cost, cost the coach a job. Washington, I spoke to Norv Turner today. Uh, even though Heath is out, he is Norv Turner's guy. He's happy to have Gus Verrott. In fact, he resisted some trade inquiries this offseason just so he can have for Rod. So that's, that's basically it, Mike. There's another situation. There's Jacksonville. Guys, Steve Berline pulled due to ineffectiveness. Uh, Burnell comes in and Mark leads the team in rushing. There's no clear answer yet. Coach Tom Coughlin says check with us on Wednesday. But for Steve Berline, Joe, oh. and this is nothing new. What a nightmare. I mean, if I was Steve Berline, I'd say, hey, look, I'm tired of being somebody's guy. In Arizona, he was Buddy's guy and got yanked in and out of the roster. Finally wound up being put into the expansion draft. Number one player taken in the expansion draft. Numero uno. First guy. Jacksonville really wants him. They're in their first regular season football game. In the third quarter, he's, quarter, he's standing on the sidelines, Mike. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, give the guy a chance to play. All these quarterback changes. I'm sitting back on the sofa after work yesterday, and I'm watching the Buffalo game. And I see Todd Collins coming at the end of the game. I said, yeah. there's a good idea. Get him some experience under live fires. Isn't that a good idea? Not. No? No, not at all. I, you know, to me, first of all, 
your offensive line and most of the starters are out on the field at the end of the game. That's the time that a quarterback can build a relationship with his team. You don't necessarily build a relationship when everything's going great. You build a relationship when things are troubled, and that's exactly what happened in Buffalo. So you're into a situation where you, you stay out on the field, you fight through with those guys. For crying out loud, you're not going to improve yourself that much, but you get a chance to look forward to next week, Jaws. To me, you got to stay out and fight. Joe, I agree with you 100%. And how many times have we both saw in our careers where, you know, a guy may be taken out of a game and the backup guy comes in down by 21 points, the defense is playing a prevent, and they're giving him all the passes, the short stuff, and he goes 8 for 8 or 10 for 10, throws a touchdown pass, and before you know it, the fans are ranting and raving. They want the backup in there to be a starter. You don't want to have that quarterback controversy, so stay with your starting guy. But one place there is not a quarterback controversy, that is Tampa Bay. Trent Dilfer yesterday had an outstanding game. You'll see right here on his drop, he reads the coverage very well to find Horace Copeland for a 64-yard touchdown pass. And when I say he read the coverage very well, he caught the Eagles safeties jumping on the square in routes. And he caught, the, he caught the post pattern to Copeland, which is the big play in the game. They were down by six. They come back to take the lead, which they never relinquished. But what I liked about Trent Dilfer yesterday is the way he led the offense. He was an inexperienced guy. Basically, they ran that no huddle most of the game, and he did an excellent job of getting the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the right play almost every time. Dilfer is for real. Maybe we're seeing some of the byproduct of those spring and summer early mornings with Sam Weish going over as much film as possible. A good start for Dilford. Now the other side of that Eagles game, the Ricky Waters fiasco. The man who would bring the Eagles a rushing game and would get the chance to get 20-plus carries a game instead won headlines for his reaction during and after the game. Waters struggled, fumbled, then was disappointed after the crowd cheered Charlie Garner's running success. And after the game, Waters admitted he didn't go all out for a pass over the middle he said, why should I? I would have gotten hurt in this situation. He said the crowd was too noisy, throwing off the timing. Yesterday, Waters had this reaction. I'm always upset when I'm not in the game because I love to play football. And I feel like I need to be on the, on the field to make plays. I can't make a play from the sideline. I'm an emotional guy. I'm going to be that way. You know, I like to win. I hate losing. I just do. And I'm sure the other guys in that, in there, they feel the same way. They just have a different way of showing it. Ron Jaworski, you were there. There was also a case of Waters trying to get back on the field only to have the offensive coordinator, John Gruden, have to grab him to keep him from getting back in the game. Boy, th this was ugly. You were there. Tell us what you saw trans transpire during the day. Mike, I I've been around professional football for 22 years, played with the Eagles for 10 years. I have never seen a player go from the penthouse to the outhouse as, as quickly as Ricky Waters did yesterday. Before the game, about an hour before the kickoff, he was running around the field, getting the crowd all pumped up. The vet was rocking and rolling. I mean, they, they sensed Ricky Waters was their man. They introduced the offense. He got a standing ovation. The place was ready for Ricky Waters, the, you know, the best free agent on, that was out there. He was in Philadelphia. Also, when he gets in the game, 17 carries, 37 yards, five catches, 34 yards, two fumbles. And, of course, those two alligator arm passes, the fans were booing him by the third quarter. I have never seen a guy turn it negatively so quick. Sterling, I think what you're going to see is the player is going to lose a little respect for him short ironing some of those passes. And, Jones, they thought I was bad in Green Bay with my attitude, they said. <laughs> well, the key here is, as Ricky Waters says he wants to stay on the field, to stay on the field, you have got to make plays. I know there are going to be mistakes. We all understand that. But the great players overcome those mistakes. I, I don't want to say this in a negative way, but I say this. You know, I, I know those passes over the middle. He was saying, you see Steve Young or whatever. If he gets ever gets the label of being a coward, that's something he's never going to shake. I don't think he is, but if they get that label, Mike, that is something you never get rid of. It gets no easier. They go to Arizona, and yesterday a Buddy Ryan defense allowed a man to run for 100 yards for the first time in six years. You think they may be going after the running back next week? Just a thought. Mm. Mort, speaking of struggling running backs, Jerome Bettis, seven carries, four yards. What's going on? <laughs> He has just not gotten into running condition yet, Mike. That, he, he was benched yesterday in favor of Leonard Russell. And I'll tell you what, his status as a starter is in question. And they're bringing Brent Moss in for a tryout this week. And one quick note there on Ricky Waters. Ray Rhodes today said he is going to have a man-to-man -man talk with Ricky Waters, who was very non-apologetic today, even after that, uh, Mike. Well, Mort, the Rams not the only team with rushing problems yesterday. Get a look at this, folks. There were only 12 rushing touchdowns in the league yesterday. The NFL average per week last year was 21. Michael Westbrook's touchdown reverse more yards on one play than four of the teams had all day. And four quarterbacks led their team in rushing Sunday. Rushing. It will be a watchword in practice this week.
around the NFL. As Prime Monday continues, soundtracks. What happens when a coach gets fired? The new regime gets rid of one of his old players? Then they meet again? You'll listen in as Prime Monday continues. Hello, hello, hello. I didn't know you. Today, Follis has three locations serving Purdue with great brand names such as Champion, Russell, Gear, and Starter. At Follis, you are guaranteed to find the very best in Purdue memorabilia. So start your game day tradition today. Boy, Lester, coach really seems upset. Do you think he's under pressure from the alumni to produce instant results? And if you won't do the job, you can go back home to mommy and daddy! Gee, I bet this is a different guy than you met during the recruiting process, huh? Are you finding this lecture motivational, or is it tearing at that delicate fabric that makes up the player-coach relationship? What about those flecks of spit? Yeah, do you find those bothersome? Near the goal line last year, you knew Emmett Smith was getting the ball. And he still scored, leading the National Football League with 22 touchdowns. The Dallas offense is not known for its great diversity, but is known for its stars and execution. As we open the playbook, we ask Ron Jaworski, how does it work, Ron, when the defense knows what's coming? Well, Mike, you know, the Cowboy passing game is, is fueled by probably one of the best quarterbacks in the game right now, that being Troy Aikman. But really, in their offensive system, he is only the trigger man for a well-designed passing attack. You create big plays by design. They are game planned against known defenses. Here the Cowboys are in the eye, with Emmett Smith the deep back behind the fullback Daryl Johnston. The strong side of this formation is the left. That's where the tight end Jay Novacek is positioned. For the Cowboys, the eye is a predominant weak side running formation. That means the majority of Smith runs go away from Novacek to the open side. Defenses know this cowboy tendency to run weak out of the eye, so they attack it. Here the Broncos will bring their weak safety up closer to the line of scrimmage before the snap. Denver has clearly committed to play the high percentage Dallas tendency. What you get is an eight-man front, a version of the 46 defense that's designed to shut down the running game. But the Cowboys go play action to the strong side. The fullback Johnson tells you that right at the snap. The Cowboys have game plan to attack this defense on first down. You see right here that Michael Irvin, the weak side wideout, is already behind the weak safety and the linebackers with no one to impede his crossing route. The strong safety will drop into deep center field to protect against the long ball, leaving the middle of the field wide open. The Cowboys have attacked the vulnerability of the defense by throwing the ball away from the weak side, the strength of this defense. Troy Aikman will hit Irvin on the strong side, and Michael will have a lot of open area. Every good offense has recognizable tendencies. You create big plays by countering your own tendencies. The Cowboys do that better than anyone. It, it seems that most teams around the league right now are trying to come up with some sort of gimmick style offense. Let it be uh, the run and shoot or a, a, some modification of the West Coast offense. But the Cowboys approach is, is very basic. It's very conventional. And really the key to their success is execution and discipline. And Joe, what a novel idea, execution <laughs> and discipline. It really is, Ronnie, but I still think you have to have the people to get it done. Sure, they have Troy and Emmett and Michael, but Kevin Williams at 5 feet 9, also their kick return guy, takes over at the wide receiver position for Alvin Harper. Alvin Harper may not have caught a lot of passes, just 33 last year, Sterling, but he averaged almost 25 yards a catch and eight touchdowns. That's a little tough to replace. That's going to be big. And if I could use the, the quote you, you gave me a couple of weeks ago, it's in the, in the days of the salary cap it's not who you have it's who you lost that will determine your success 
Michael Irvin is going to absorb some of that, that in losing uh, Alvin Harper. But here's the key. They're not going to change their offense to do it. They're going to continue to do the same things, but what they're going to do is get a little bit more diversified, and those linebackers are going to have to stay at home on the play-action pass, Mike. At, at each position, they have strength, and that's what you love about watching the Dallas offense. How does it fit towards the Giants' defense? Ronnie's going to answer that in the playbook a little bit later on the show. There's much more coming up on Prime Monday, including our Prime Minutes, our Knights of the Roundtable standing by for that as we get ready for the G-Men and the Cowboys from the Meadowlands. The Larry Jones has made plenty of news, not a full-fledged verbal war of words with Commissioner Paul Tagliabue, but something close to it. Bet we'd all like to be there the next time this duo shares a carbonated beverage just to hear the conversation. So good to have Bob Engelhart's illustrations back on Prime Monday again this year. The Cowboys, who start this season at the Meadowlands, ended their regular season at the Swamp Stadium in Jersey last year. The Giants, of course, share the Meadowlands with the New York Jets. The two New York teams played a great preseason game this year, and tonight in Soundtracks, we listen to Jets coach Rich Kotite as he and Boomer Esiason just kind of get used to one another. Hirsch! Herschel! Herschel! How are you, babe? I'm happy for you, babe. Doing? Yeah, boy, I told I right? told Dan you got a great opportunity for okay, you. You're gonna good. help them, babe. They wish you the best. Hey, good luck to you. Thanks, hey, babe. sorry for all the hey, junk. Hey, 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 that's we move right. on, right? Yes, that's true. I'm glad that you and I both got a great opportunity. Oh, all right. All right. Hey, good all right, luck to you. I love you. I love you too, babe. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, here we go. Boom, in and out of the huddle. Queen right rum. Hot right 94. Red left. Pocket. 17. Z in. In and out now. Strong right. Z. K-34 Cadillac. Uh-oh, we're in trouble here. Come on, let's play. Come on, let's go. Oh, oh no. What happened? Guy came clean. Hey, 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 come on, babe. It's killing us now. Let's relax. Come on. What do you got, Richie? Slot red right. Check with me. Fast 47 or 80. Okay. To the weak side, to the tight end. Yeah, okay. The guy with the 80 number. Yeah, I know, I know. All right, come on, baby. We, we came from the eight-yard line. Right? Yeah, we got to get touchdown. I, I understand that, okay? But don't second-guess what, you know, what no. you're doing or I'm doing. I'm not second-guessing. I, mean, I like just, what you're doing. Okay. Ah, calm down. Calm down. Come on, defense. Get your asses going. Come on now. Let's hey, hey, hey. This is serious business. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. 60 minutes. Put it on the air. Hey, hey, 60 minutes. Let's go, babe. Tough eye left, power 45 lead. Come on now. Suck it up now. Hey! It was a good drive, wasn't it? Let's go, defense. Let's go, let's go. Come on. Oh, no, oh, no. Their money's worth tonight. Huh? We're proud to announce that lease terms on the 1995 Trooper are not only the lowest they've been all year. Defense did not allow more than 21 points in any preseason game. But the offense will take Dallas as far as they go in 95. Tonight's Prime Monday minutes begin with Skip Bayless from the Insider in Dallas. He has a thought on one of the key offensive trio. Skip? Mike, thanks uh, very much. Okay, so the Cowboys feel that they must sign Deion Sanders to keep him away now from the 49ers. Deion definitely is the 49er catalyst. He is not the Cowboy catalyst. Emmett Smith is. Emmett has proven to be even more valuable in big games than even Troy Aikman. So forget Deion tonight. Tonight and this season, the Cowboys hang from the frayed threads of Emmett's hamstrings. They know it, and so unfortunately does he. Now, I used to think Emmett was a naive, humble kid who ran his big heart out for this team. Remember that final game in 93 at Giant Stadium when he shouldered the load on a busted shoulder? Well, lately, Emmett has become more of a testy, attention-loving prima donna Ooh. who delights in Ooh. keeping the world and his coaches in suspense about those hamstrings. Have they become chronic problems as they were last year? Now, one day, Emmett gets mad when we ask about them. The next. He complains about his hands. He barely tested them in the preseason, so tonight we find out. All I know for sure is that the Cowboys need a healthy, happy number 22 far more than a new number 21. 
Now, speaking of great cornerbacks, the second best one in the NFL is gone, isn't he, Michael? Yes, Skip. As I watched the replays of Rod Woodson's collapse without contact yesterday, I knew immediately what to blame. AstroTurf. If the Steelers had been playing on grass, that injury would not have occurred. Of course, you could say Woodson was lucky. He was only half as injured as Wendell Davis, who ruptured both patella tendons two years ago by simply landing on the thinly veiled concrete that passes as a playing surface in Philadelphia. Davis is just now coming back with the Colts. Players and management are both at fault. Players are willing to strike for free agency and a share of licensing, ignoring the obvious fact that the easiest way to increase earnings is to lengthen careers by demanding that these crippling artificial surfaces be replaced with grass. Here, here. That would be worth striking for. Management says it costs too much to maintain natural grass fields, but that didn't stop the installation of grass platforms when World Cup soccer waved a few million dollars in the faces of people who make such irresponsible decisions and what makes more sense, resurfacing a field or losing a Hall of Fame cornerback whose loss just may keep the Steelers out of the Super Bowl. Mitch, uh, there's not much to celebrate in Pittsburgh right now. No, but speaking <laughs> of celebration, Michael, there is a new film making the rounds of college football teams these days, and it shows what celebrations you can and can't do under the new NCAA rules. Well, I hereby nominate this film for Best Comedy, since as long as the NFL believes in the touchdown two-step, the whole premise is a bit of a joke. Now let's face it, kids imitate the pros. And as we saw yesterday, dancing is in fine form in the NFL. The old shake, the old bake. You don't think there are college players jumping up during commercials and trying these moves in front of the mirror? Of course they are. The same way they try Michael Jordan's dunks or Barry Sanders cut moves. Yes, the NCAA now says celebrating is a bad thing, but that's what they told us about having girls in our dorm room. It didn't keep us from wanting to do that either. It would be nice if quiet dignity were considered as cool as the end zone dice roll. But as long as the NFL allows showing off, the NCAA is doing one thing, delaying the inevitable, forcing kids to dance in the dark and dream of the day when they too can shake their booty in front of 50 million people just like the grown-ups do. Uh, Mike? Did you see Tim McDonald, when he scored on his interception in New Orleans, he kind of did a little Dion on the way down the sidelines, and he told me yesterday, I saw only big guys chasing me, so I knew I could give Dion a little message that All we're thinking right. of. Dion's everywhere. You can work him into any That's story. Right. Watch. No more. As Prime Monday continues before the Cowboys and the Giants, Leslie Visser backstage with Troy Aikman, a quarterback whose approach to the 95 season is a little different. For safety's sake, I'm going with the high tops and knee braces, and I, I'm no longer worried about my mobility. I'm just saying I want to get off the field each week healthy. Everyone Ready for the Giants and the Cowboys in there. Speaking, I believe, with Al Michaels of ABC is Dave Brown, 9-6 and six as a starter last season. He enters the season with a six-game winning streak. Won the last six last year, including the last one against the Giants. Dan Deerdorf will join Al and Frank and Lynn Swan for the Monday Night Football broadcast on ABC. Good to see Dan again with us here on Prime Monday. Let me ask you about Dave Brown. In his maturation process, do you think he's a quarterback that can lead the Giants to the playoffs? I think he's a very talented quarterback, Mike. The problem is I don't think anybody knows how, how good Dave Brown can be. Uh, I think we're looking for a lot of answers this preseason. Just didn't get them by virtue of the fact that he only threw 32 balls the entire preseason. That's not nearly enough work for a guy like Dave Brown. He, he still has to prove himself, I think, not only to the other people in the NFL, but to the Giants fans as well. How do you see Herschel Walker fitting in with the Giants? Oh, I think he's the guy that that gives him that receiver out of the backfield as far as Dave Meggett uh, being gone is concerned. It, I think he's got to give Dave Brown a lot of confidence. And Herschel Walker is a remarkable physical specimen. That's no secret. Everybody knows it. And he is still capable of taking any handoff at any time and going the length of the field with it. I know you had a chance to speak with some of the Cowboy folks. All this discussion of rededication during the offseason. Uh, give me uh, your sense of the temperature of the Cowboys as they get set to embark on this 95 season. I don't think that that's just idle chatter on the part of the Dallas Cowboys. They have extremely good internal leadership. You know, when you hear the Michael Urbans of the world talking like that, uh, they're not just, that's not lip service for the newspapers and the TV people. Uh, they really mean it. And this is a driven, motivated football team. I, I, I'll be highly shocked at this Cowboy team if they don't get major people injured, if they don't win 14 games this year. I think it's a lock. 
All right, Dan, thank you. We'll see you at 9 Eastern with Al, Frank, and Lynn. As Prime Monday continues in a few minutes, Leslie Visser goes backstage. Troy Aikman will tell you all the rumors about all those girlfriends, which ones are true and which ones aren't true, if any of them are true. Next, we'll get Joe and Sterling surfing the net to answer your computer questions, including the impact of the return of Eric Williams to the Cowboys line. U.S. Golf Champ. Well, after working with me for six weeks, Sterling thought I was incompetent. He needed somebody to ask better questions. So we asked you on the ESPN Net Sports Zone to send your questions. And Tim from University Park, PA, Nittany Lion Land, wants to know the Herschel Walker positive impact on the Giants and how badly, Sterling, will the Giants miss Dave Megan? Well, the first, well, the first talk about the, the Herschel Walker factor, Herschel's going to be a great addition to the Giants. And it's not only because of his great ability and being a physical specimen, but in the locker room. He is going to dispel a lot of those little skirmishes uh, dealing with confidence. And one thing that he does, he's got the ability to take anything and go anywhere with it. And that's the one thing the Giants got him for. As far as Dave Meggett, Dave Meggett is a guy that came in and was loved by everyone because all he did was make plays. He was a little guy that everybody could identify with because he didn't look like the quick, big, strong football player, but they're really going to miss this guy on special teams. So interesting in football how two guys guys who are so different size-wise can fill the same roles, it's third down, change of pace, and special teams. That's true. All right, Joe, we'll surf the net for you. Here's our next question off the ESPN Net Sports Zone. Robert in Houston wants to know, although I don't think one player can single-handedly win a game for the team, does Eric Williams back to Dallas give them that much bigger an edge in this game tonight? Mike, it's funny Robert should ask that question because actually I believe he can. What Eric Williams coming back does, it allows Larry Allen to go back to guard. Now Ray Donaldson has taken over at center and it's a new position on this football team for him. So Larry Allen can help Ray Donaldson out. If you don't believe that's enough, take a look at some of these statistics. In games for rushing, for example, with the first seven games with Eric Williams, they average 127 yards, only 118 without him. But look at the yards per attempt. 4.2 with Eric, 3.6 without him, and sacks allowed. Now, that's the one that Troy Aikman is interested in. Seven without him, 13 when he wasn't there. So I should say seven with him, 13 when he wasn't there. So to me, Mike, uh, the kid makes a heck of a difference. Michael may have put it right. He may be the best player in the league. As tough as it is getting around Eric Williams, it was just as tough picking out the questions off the ESPN Net Sports Zone. Some great questions, and Joe and Sterling really enjoyed going through them. If you want to ask your questions on the Sports Zone, <laughs> ask NFL Prime Monday, http colon backward slash backward slash ESPNNet.SportsZone.com. If you don't understand, Got to start surfing the web, folks. Jerry Jones says this guy is the heart of the team. Michael Irvin, now starting his eighth NFL season. Irvin was watching a tape of the NFC title game this summer, and that trademark Irvin smile as bright as his jewelry, it was replaced by a glare. Last year was not good enough for Michael Irvin, who before starting the 95 season a short time ago, stopped by to chat with Leslie Visser. The Cowboys and the Giants have had many memorable games and dozens of memorable players. But one recent addition to this rivalry is Herschel Walker, who once wore the silver and blue. At 33 years old, he was brought here to the Giants to replace Dave Meggett, but his role has become much more significant. There's no doubt my duties are uh, a little bit expanded. I think people have said Dave made it, make it because Dave left. Dave is a great bike. He did a lot of good things here, but I think I bring a lot, a lot of different things than Dave bring, and he brought a lot of different things than I brought, and uh, I think it's going to be a, a role that I'm going to look forward to. Now in his 11th year in the league, Herschel Walker started his NFL career in 1986 as a Dallas Cowboy. If I hadn't left, they wouldn't have won two Super Bowl rings. You know, I think I was the uh, bad apple in the, uh, in the barrel a little bit. One matchup to watch tonight is Michael Irvin against the Giant cornerbacks. By now, Michael Irvin is quite familiar with the Giants' two deep zone. We expect them to stay in their base defense. Uh, we're going to try to run, and hopefully uh, our game plan is to try to get up early, get up for a couple touchdowns early, and bring them out of their base defense, make them drop a safety down in there and, and, and try to make sure they stop the run so they can stop us from killing the clock and then kind of get me and Troy off to run some balls. Well, they've been known in the past to complain about to the officials about you. Do you push off? Hey, all I do is play football. I, I really don't, you know, and I, and I try to get in a DB's head in that sense. I say, hey, guys, if you're going to complain, that means you already set, you up for self, set yourself up for failure. So that's what I say to DB's. If you're setting yourself up saying, hey, he's going to push off, he's pushing off, you've already put in your head that I'm going to beat you, and you're trying to get a little help from the DB. All I do is play the game. 
With Alvin Harper gone, the Cowboys are likely to move Irvin around a little more, so Mike, everyone will have a chance to be pushed around by him. <laughs> And who does Troy Aikman get the ball to? Well, Leslie goes backstage with Troy Aikman coming up in a little bit on Prime Monday. Also ahead on the show, Chris Mortensen will join us with more news on the NFL as we get closer to Herschel Walker's official Giant debut, the man who made his NFL debut as a Cowboy against the Giants in 86. <laughs> Continue some more injury news today from around the league. Jacksonville's James Stewart injured after his six-carry, 25-yard game. Partially torn right rotator cuff. Further word on him as the week goes on, but not a good start on the injury front, as well as the loss for the Jaguars. In addition to Stewart, the Bears without their running back, Raymond Harris, for two to three months with a broken collarbone. The Raiders already without Don Mosbar have lost Gerald Perry indefinitely to a broken arm. Ricky Prohl's Seattle debut will be his only game for a while. He's out eight weeks with a broken fibula. That'll put a crimp in the three-receiver offense that Dennis Erickson would like to run. Let's go back to Chris Mortensen. Mort, speaking of wide receiver injuries, Alvin Harper didn't play for Tampa. What's an update on his status for next week? Well, Mike, he's still hobbling on that bad ankle. And even though Alvin says he's a quick healer, the Bucks really prefer for him to sit out another week against Cleveland. Horace Copeland, in his place, had a great preseason, had, had a big touchdown yesterday. And the, what they really want is Alvin Harper to be ready for their home opener against the Chicago Bears, which should be a pretty big game, Mike. Then, more there's the Steve Young situation. I mentioned it earlier. He got roughed up in that New Orleans game. Harris Barton was out of the lineup. I'm sure Young would like to know, and so would we. How is Harris doing? Well, he's a, another similar situation to Harper. The coaches prefer that Harris sit out this week against the Atlanta Falcons. And the Falcons have a blitzing team under new defensive coordinator Joe Herring. They had nine sacks against the Carolina Panthers yesterday. And Young taking a beating, I think, has to be a concern for the 49ers, Mike. But even a bigger concern, and yes, I want to mention Dion here, <laughs> is cornerback Marquez Pope, a converted safety, was beat three times yesterday, including one for this touchdown that we're going to see here. And Pope was a free agent pickup or a trade pickup there from the Rams, and it's not panning out. Harris Barton said it himself. Dion is not a luxury. He's a necessity for the 49ers, Mike. Next week, everybody has a two-Dion limit. That's it. Yesterday, more, the Dolphins announced the league had cleared Dan Marino in that stock deal. Is this the last that we've heard of that? No, we haven't, Mike. In fact, I spoke with the league official a little while ago, and he says that was just temporary. Uh, the Dolphins have not provided the proper documents yet to clear Marino, and even though they think it'll be cleared, uh, that's a story that's not finished yet, Mike. And more, both you and I, and I think everyone, our hats off to Dom Capers for thinking about going for two, down one in the closing seconds at Atlanta. They had the penalty. They couldn't go for the two-point conversion, but it certainly would have been a great statement to send to the fans. Thanks, Mort. As we continue on Prime Monday, Troy Aikman, he's getting ready for the game tonight against the Giants. We'll go backstage. Leslie Visser talks with Troy as we continue. Split Fire earned a United States patent. To you by Intel. Look for the Intel Inside Pentium processor symbol to get the best performance for all your PC software. He has the big arm, good looks, great team, and big city to be the superstar quarterback that many aspire to be. But to be honest, few are. Stardom in the land of the star on the helmet brings extraordinary scrutiny. Troy Aikman, subject of our backstage feature this year, Leslie Visser, taking the stars of the NFL away from the game. Mike, Troy Aikman has suffered a half a dozen concussions, been inaccurately linked with glamorous women, and endured the judgment of an entire nation. Yet through it all, he's remained a cool cowboy. In fact, he reminds a lot of people of a legend we recently lost. Okay, I guess this is the Aikman estate. <laughs> Can you sort of show us where things will be? And well, when they'll be? When they will be <laughs> is quite some time away. It'll probably be a year and a half before it's done. And the house is going just at the foot of that hill there. And did you consider that Terry Bradshaw is your neighbor? <laughs> did you? Yeah, I did. Despite that, I feel about the laugh. They sell coke out here? Yeah. They sell coke everywhere in the, in the world, oh, as a matter of fact. In I was, particularly in Dallas, yes. <laughs> and uh, I always enjoy drinking my coke. <laughs> Got it. 
you've had, I think, six concussions in your career. I mean, what, what's your whole take on that? I've gone to different measures this year trying to keep from getting a concussion, and I've gone with the longer face mask and, and uh, a little bit different helmet than what I've worn in the past. And then also, for safety's sake, I'm going with the high tops and knee braces. And I, I'm no longer worried about my mobility. I'm just saying I want to get off the field each week healthy. The day that Mickey Mantle died, John Madden and I went over to Mickey Mantle's restaurant, and I don't know if you ever knew this, but the front of Mickey Mantle's restaurant, which is on Central Park South, had, of course, all memorabilia of Mickey Mantle, and in the middle of it was your jersey. And, you know, I had always heard that he wanted to meet you and never got to. I think it was because he was from Oklahoma and, and, and I was from Oklahoma that there was an interest in, in us meeting and uh, getting together and playing golf. So I invited Mickey to my golf tournament this past May and he came in. So we were really slow that day and I waited about an hour for Mickey to come through because I'd still not yet met him. And uh, then I got sidetracked doing some things for the tournament and Mickey came in, finished his round of golf and immediately got in his car and went home. I'll regret it for the rest of my life. Mickey spent seven hours at my golf tournament. In fact, his round, last round of golf was at my golf tournament. Oh. And, uh, and I never met him. You don't think he looks like you? You can't see How it? can you ask me that? Because look at it. That's huh? exactly what... Let me see if I can find someone here who looks like no. you. Are you... Uh huh? <laughs> looks like he's got, got ears like mine. <laughs> you know? Well, let me ask you. Could you hit a home run 545 feet? I can't hit a golf ball that far. <laughs> Just to put the minds at ease of millions of women across America are the following, um, not uh, of the moment. Nancy Kerrigan, Sandra Bullock, and Monica Sellis, a late entry. A <laughs> late entry. <laughs> I met Monica at the Toronto game. She was on the sidelines, and in fact, uh, Mr. Jones, Jerry Jones, asked me if I would uh, give her an autograph. So I said, well, certainly I will. And I'm a fan of hers and happy to see her back on the tennis circuit. And, and that was the extent of that meeting. Nancy Kerrigan, I've never spoken to, I've never met in my life, uh, and yet uh, it was reported that I was sending flowers to her daily. And, and so it, it becomes uh, it becomes very comical. And then uh, and then Sandra, I, I met her, and she seems like a wonderful person. And, uh, and beyond that, there's there's never been a dating relationship between she and I. What is the truth? You're giving up your salary. You're not giving up your salary. You'd be willing to. What is it? Leslie, that was tongue-in-cheek. You know, you yeah. can't always believe everything that you read. <gasps> the media? Can you believe that? Disappointed you? <laughs> <laughs> and I made the comment jokingly sure. that, that, hey, if uh, if Deion Sanders coming to Dallas guarantees us a Super Bowl win, then, uh, then, then I'll play for free. And uh, someone said, well, there's no guarantee that if Deion comes, you, you'll win the Super Bowl. Bingo. Got a point. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm, I guess I'm going to get paid this year. I guess <laughs> When asked about Dion as a receiver, Troy said he'd love it. He also said Dion would have to work at it. Dion would have to go to meetings, which is difficult since the offensive and defensive meetings are held simultaneously. Well, as for Troy Aikman, the land baron, if you're a good friend, drop in. Troy is building seven bathrooms, ten bedrooms, and a six-car garage. Mike, it sounds like a great location for Prime Monday. <laughs> we'll take the show on the road like college game day, right? Why not? That would be a good move. Troy's house. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, we'll, we look forward to the backstage pieces. Troy's comment, guys, he said it was tongue-in-cheek, but Joe, do you think there's something there, don't you? You know, I do in a little bit of a way. I think Troy Aikman would love to have Deion Sanders play there, and I find that, you know, people say he'd like to have him there for this one year, and I wonder... How much longer will Troy Aikman continue to play football if he'd love to get back to the Super Bowl as badly as everybody says and all the things that he wants to do is this year? Sterling, I'm curious. Could we see maybe within a hit or so Troy Aikman leaving the game within a year? I really don't think we're that far away. You know, this guy's really, he's done just about everything, and I don't think records mean a whole lot to him. I mean, he's led his team to back-to-back to -back Super Bowls. The guy has, you know, he's done a lot for, for the NFL. He's done a lot for the Dallas Cowboys, and I don't know what's left. And, Jaws, the one thing I like about Troy Aikman the most, his receivers get to keep their feet on the ground when catching his passes. Ron is speechless by that comment, Sterling. That's, that's a first. That's a first. That's a first. I'll tell you something. That is a first. I agree with you. That, that, would, that would never happen, guys. I always have something to say. <laughs> <Let's> say <it. laughs> He's back. He, he, I'm, I'm, I am back, and I've got something to say. You know why, Sterling, that their feet are on the ground? Because he hits them right in the stomach where you want the ball to come and they can run with it. Troy Aikman will have an MVP season. Guys, we're talking about Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin. Yes, great players. Troy Aikman fuels that offense. And what makes him so special? I think the timing and discipline that he understands in the passing game. When he drops back on that three-step drop, 
bang, 1.5 seconds. He drops back in that five-step drop, bang, 2.1 seconds, the ball's out. He understands that while he's dropping back and reading the coverage. Mike, he's going to have a terrific year and many more. We'll take note of that, Ron. A little bit later on Prime Monday, our Knights of the Roundtable join us again. Back to discuss the Dallas psyche if the D word does not become the man with a star on the side of his helmet. And Drew Bledsoe, is he coming of age? The maturation process continues. We'll get the thoughts of Skip, Mike, and Mitch when we come back. I'm dead. I'm dead. 1,000 hits. <laughs> 2,000 head cracks. <laughs> and 500 body slams. But the trouble is, it's not on the football field. <laughs> Violence shouldn't be a part of real life. Think about it. Hi, can I help you? Yeah, I've got this white house, uh -huh. and I'm thinking about a new color. No, Pom was at a Redskins game this weekend. Mitch Albin was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, <laughs> dedication in Cleveland, and he played, too, and his band's terrific. And Skip here Bayless from The Insider is just here with yes. us. <laughs> no, you, Skip? I'm the nowhere man. Among the topics, we've been joking about it, but on a serious note, is Jerry Jones setting up the Cowboys for a psychological fall if Dion does not sign with Dallas? Yeah, I think there, Mike, is a serious danger of that. And by the way, I spoke to Jerry Jones today, and he seemed far less optimistic than he has the last three or four weeks about signing Dion Sanders. Remember, a year ago, he felt he let his team down by not making a run at Dion. And as we talked about the first show last year about this time, Michael Irvin, Emmett Smith are in awe of Deion Sanders, and Jerry felt he let the team down, not keeping him away from the 49ers but, but as their there, catalyst. If there's ever been a team that's constructed to, to deal with outside influences and just shrug them off, it's the Dallas Cowboys. They go through it on a know. daily basis they, down there. Like Deion was the difference last no, year. I'm too, not, many, there are too many missing pieces with the Cowboys now with all the losses they had for Deion to be the missing piece as he might have been with the 49ers last year. I'm not sure. I, keep I have two thoughts on Deion go going to Dallas. On the one hand, I think because he hasn't done it yet, and it's one more thing that he could say, yeah, I did that. I was a Cowboy. He'd go. On the other hand, in San Francisco, he's the only real colorful star. That's, that's a pretty bland that's, team that's there with a pretty staid coach. He goes to Dallas. There are a lot of guys. Nate Newton, he may not even get a word in right. edgewise with Nate talking. Michael Irvin's colorful. You got Troy, you got Emmett. He may prefer being in San Francisco where he's the big I, star. I agree with you because there's a lot of fear on the part of the players in Dallas that he would be a negative catalyst. Now, they want to keep him away from the 49ers. They're so in awe of him. But how would he fit with Dallas? They might have to change their whole defensive scheme, which is very team-oriented, to assimilate Dion into that. He may have to just be like a side sideline ornament for Jerry Jones. Now, he may play offense also, and you heard us, so let me get you guys to weigh in on the discussion we just had. How much longer do you guys think Troy Aikman will go? I mean, given the fact that he's had, what, six concussions already, Skip? Yeah. I mean, and he's not the kind of guy, Sterling mentioned, to just hang around for records. What is he, 28 years old now? Two Super Bowls. How, many, how much left is there for him? He will not, he will not be a 35-year-old quarterback in this league. I don't think he'll well, be a 33-year-old quarterback in this league. I think he'll be gone by he then. He took the worst first six-year pounding of any quarterback, I think, in history, dating back to the 89-90 teams. They were also like almost like expansion teams for Jimmy Johnson at that point. Right, you know, there's another team play tonight, which we had just sort of forgotten about the Giants. You guys keep talking about Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Skip, I'm going to tell you right I've now. I've forgotten start about an argument. Right. Card said we'll start Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Right Dallas. Now and tell you that the Giants can win ten games this year. The Giants are as close to the Cowboys as the Cowboys are the 49ers. Oh, okay. After the losses, fine, the 49ers. Fine, I'll tell made. you what. The I, Cowboys you just, you just throw me uh, Troy, Emmett, and Michael, and you can have uh, Charlie Brown. No, it's Dave Brown <laughs> and uh, and the other two guys at their position. I'll take there. Dan okay. Reeves in that defense. Hey, let me ask you about the Giants old coach Bill Parcells and his quarterback Drew Bledsoe. Another great game. Are we seeing Drew Bledsoe reach that Aikman, Young, Marino level, guys? In one game? That'd be a hell of an accomplishment. Is he there? I mean, he put him there in the offseason. Well, I think he's, he's, he's going to get to that stage. I think if you go, history shows that most quarterbacks uh, take at least three years to really mature. I think even Elway right. and, and, and Marino had a great second season with all the, the touchdown passes he threw. But Elway took three or four years to get to the Super Bowl. Montana was, but, you know, one of the things about uh, Drew Bledsoe is he's not playing with uh, Michael Irvin at receiver or Jerry I don't know Rice. About that. I'll tell you what, before it's over, uh, Parcells will make sure that Bledsoe is surrounded by a lot better team than Shula's ever surrounded Dan Marino with. Wait, that wait, takes but time. Shula had a Super Bowl winning team around Dan Marino. They went to the Super Bowl with David Woodley, and Marino was plugged into that outfit. I mean, yeah, Drew Bledsoe does not have that kind of talent around him now. It's going to take some time, but the problem is these snap judgments with quarterbacks. I mean, in Washington, because Shula hasn't done that much yet, everybody wants him benched right now. 
now after 12 starts in favor of Gus well, Rock. He should be. You, you, don't, <laughs> you don't come of age in a game. I mean, it's, but, it's but a But he, he has a couple things going for him. Tremendous physical yeah. talent and the right coach yeah, guiding him. And Parcells is a good How quarterback. Good England coach. is already. I think they came of age yesterday. We will see more about them next week. Yes. They play Miami. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll see you back here next week. Uh, later on this show, Distant Replay, talking quarterbacks. When Staubach and Morton gave absolute new meaning to the word quarterback controversy. If you don't remember, Chris Berman will be along to jog your memories. Prime Monday continues. Stay with us. Nonstop football? Yeah! All right, I love it. Pass the pickle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Special night tonight at Giant Stadium. They are retiring the jersey of number 11, Philip Sims. Remember, fourth and 17 in the Super Bowl season for the Giants. This completion at Minnesota to Bobby Johnson. Phil told me last year one of the biggest plays in his career. His number 11 will be retired at the Meadowlands tonight. Earlier, Ron showed us how defenses facing the Dallas offense know what's coming and still they can't stop the Cowboy offense. How do the Dallas, Dallas tendencies mesh with what the Giants defense does best? Jaws reopens the playbook and this time he's there with me. All right. Hey Mike, the, the, the Giant defense is a very consistent defense and it's probably the constant of their whole football team right now. And their defense may be conservative in design but very effective in the results. Here you see the Giants defensive line positioned in what is called an undership. Look at right end Coleman Rudolph. He's the weak side defensive end, and he's lined up outside the offensive tackle. You see that the tight end for the Jets is positioned on the other side, away from Rudolph. So he's matched up weak side, not the strong side of the shift. When you undershift to the weak side, you position your strong side outside linebacker over the tight end. You see Corey Miller head off on the Jets tight end. The reason you undershift your front is to defend the weak side running game. The wide positioning of the defensive end allows him to funnel everything back to the inside where the linebackers can flow to the football. And the Cowboys are a predominant weak side running team, although they seldom run weak out of the split back formation. But you can count on seeing this defensive alignment tonight. From the sideline camera, you see that behind this undershifted front, the Giants play double zone coverage, with safeties Jesse Campbell and Maurice Douglas turning at the snap to cover their deep outside responsibilities. Here, the Jets go play action. The play is designed to get this back down the seam in the middle of the field behind the linebackers. That's the vulnerable area against the straight double zone. You'll see that the design of the play defeats the Giants defense with the back wide open in the middle. The Cowboys will dictate this matchup using their tight end Jay Novacek. And even though Boomer does not attack the vulnerable area of the defense, it's open. And you can be sure Troy Aikman will attack it. If the Giants have confidence in their linebackers to take away the middle of the field from Novacek, and it's a big if, then the double zone principle is a solid approach against the Cowboys passing game. The, the Giants base defense, the double zone, will try to take away the Dallas wide outs. But I tell you, that presents a problem because when those safeties split, they have no force for the run. That'll open it up for Emmett Smith. Also, Joe, when they split those safeties, it opens up the middle for Jay Novacek. Uh, you touch on it absolutely perfectly, Ron. You diagrammed it perfectly. You described it perfectly. I think tonight, though, the Giant defense is afforded a luxury. There is no Alvin Harper on the other side. I have to be careful of Kevin Williams, but Sterling, I'm not sure if he's going to hurt them as much as an Alvin Harper would opposite Michael Irvin. Well, especially, Joe, the way they like to throw it up to Alvin to make the big play. But here's the key. Dallas goes against this defense every day. I mean, they see it themselves because it's a Dallas Cowboy box poach. The only difference between Dallas's defense and the Giants, the speed on the inside. Their inside linebackers on the play action pass have got to be able to run Mike to get back to keep Michael Irvin and Jay Novacek out of that dead area. A box poach? That's what it's called. Number we'll two goes away. We'll explain that next week. Number two goes away, you double number one. <laughs> we'll have to make the show two hours to explain the terms he's dropping on us. When we come back on Prime Monday, Chris Berman will take us back to Herschel Walker's NFL debut, then back. 25 years to a time when the Cowboys had a quarterback controversy and Tom Landry had an unpopular way of settling it. It was silly. The whole thing was a joke. 
It's the ultimate who plays. It was like two ships passing the night. We're you know, running back after a play, and I think one of the poor decisions that uh, Tom Landry made. It was the subject of much discussion. If we move the... Emmett Smith in his last five games against the Giants, 868 yards from scrimmage and eight touchdowns, ready to open the season in the Meadowlands in about 13 minutes. Time for Distant Replay. We welcome back Chris Berman. All right, Mike, thank you. What a great way to open the Monday night season. Great rivalry between the Cowboys and Giants. In the last 10 years, each of these two franchises has won a pair of Super Bowls. Of course, remember that great regular season game that closed the 93 season. Emmett Smith playing hurt, leading the Cowboys to their 16-13 overtime victory, a win that enabled the Cowboys to have a much-needed bye the next week, sent the Giants on the road to San Francisco, and a win that really enabled the Cowboys uh, to breathe and go on to repeat as Super Bowl champs beating the Bills again. The Giants tonight debut a running back who is certainly no stranger to the Meadowlands. Herschel Walker began his professional football career with the New Jersey Generals. He's also, of course, no stranger to the Dallas Cowboys. Herschel Walker and Dallas opened up the Monday night season on September 8, 1986 against the Giants in Big D. Remember? Herschel Walker's arrival from the USFL and his salary, twice as much as Tony Dorsett was making, caused a preseason stir. And the Monday night opener with the Giants was the first test of the chemistry between the two Iceman winning tailbacks. Dorsett got the start and the first score on a 36-yard pass from Danny White. Walker matched it with a one-yard plunge, and the Cowboys were up by 14. But Phil Simms would end this season as the MVP of Super Bowl 21, and he started it with a 300-yard, three-touchdown effort, keeping the game even. Simms' final strike, a 44-yarder to Bobby Johnson, put the Giants up 28-24 with 5.24 to go. But with Dorsett sidelined with a sprained ankle, Walker carried the load scoring from 10 yards out for the game winner with a minute 16 left. Dallas 31, New York 28. For Walker, the season would end with over 1,500 total yards and 14 touchdowns. For the Cowboys, the season would end at 7-9, their first losing mark since 1964, and the first of five straight sub-500 seasons. But it started with a win over the soon-to-be Super Bowl champs, one of only two losses the Giants would suffer in all of 1986. This is Herschel Walker's 10th NFL season since the demise of the USFL. Now think about that. 10 years since that league ended, and still there are close to 30 players still in the National Football League with USFL experience. These aren't just ho-hum guys. Guys like Jim Kelly and Steve Young, guys like Reggie White and William Fuller, the rush man, guys like Gary Clark, our favorite centers, Hull and Oates, Kent Hull and Bart Oates, and of course Nate Newton, who you'll see on the field at guard tonight for the Dallas Cowboys. Of course, playing for the Dallas Cowboys has been magical since the mid-60s. Almost every year, they're a Super Bowl contender. The two-pronged monster at quarterback that led the Cowboys to their first visits to the Super Bowl were different as night and day. Roger Staubach and Craig Morton. That's tonight's Distant Replay. In 1971, a divisive quarterback controversy erupted between number 14, Craig Morton, and number 12, Roger Staubach. There. No, yeah, you can use them pretty much in here. Yeah, you can Meredith, who had retired, stay with Rich, showed up at practice can. one day, okay. and he told Morton, he said, Curly, this guy is a little bit nuts. You better watch him. He may get your job. Roger was the type of guy that he did, couldn't be friends with his competitors. He knew that I wanted this job, though, so, I, so we weren't friends. It was a very tough decision for me to, to decide which one was going to lead us into the 70s. Coach Landry lost maybe a little credibility in the fact that he didn't name a starter and say, this is my man, this is who we're going with, and we're going to build a team around him. Landry decided to alternate quarterbacks by game. One week Morton, the next Staubach. And a season begun on two wings and a prayer threatened to crash land on takeoff. Roger was always on the verge of, uh, of making a big play, but at the same point, I think Coach Landry thought he was also on the... Uh, on the verge of making a bad play. Bad plays became bad games. Then bad omens portended disaster when the groundhog popped up, then down again, a sure sign of a long winter of discontent. Yeah, there was a lot of controversy about uh, who the quarterback's going to be, and there's a lot of people that were calling for Roger. There's no question there was uh, division on the team. I don't know, he always thought I was to blame for losing all the games, and he would sit up, stay, be in the locker room, and there'd be some press around, and a couple of times he'd, he'd just point me and say, that's the reason we're losing. And he'd point over and he said, Morton. 
When Landry decided to rotate his quarterbacks by play, he dumbfounded sports writers. I always say, well, I had a feel. And that's the worst thing a reporter wants is to somebody to say you got a feel. Quarterbacks were aghast. The team was, you know, threw up his hands and said, thought, you know, what's next? I looked over at Craig, he's looking at me, and he said, geez, did, 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 did he just say what I already said? We're gonna alternate plays? And it was it was really to me ridiculous. It was silly. The whole thing was a joke. It's for alternated plays. It was like two ships passing the night. We're you know, running back after a play, and I think one of the poor decisions that uh, Tom Landry made. This dizzying quarterback carousel marked the flashpoint of the crisis. Landry thought that no matter who the engineer was, the train would stay on the tracks. It was a great coach deciding no matter who's in behind the center there, as long as they do what I tell them to do, we're going to win. Landry to this day will tell you that he thinks that's the ultimate system. I'd still do it today if I was coaching. They won't like it. People don't like it. The Cowboys staggered to their third loss in seven games. Two days later, the season was dramatically saved by Tom Landry. He called me up 10.30 at night, and he said, can you come over? And go in his little trophy room and sit down. He says, well, I've decided to go with Staubach. Thanks for coming over. And that was it. You know, I think it was probably a flip of the coin. I don't know how they, how they did it, but I, I was the most excited I've ever been in my entire life, and they told me I was going to start the rest of the season. I think Roger was capable of pulling games out where maybe Craig wasn't. Craig went into some games with some doubt about whether he was gonna win or lose. And I don't think Roger ever went into a game like that. I think Roger always went into a game expecting to win. Behind their inspirational general, the Cowboys won 10 straight games, including their first Super Bowl triumph, where Staubach was named the most valuable player. Landry was pledging the team's future to Staubach. The other guy was, was destined to be the number two from here on out, so the loser had to leave town. In 1975, Morton was traded to the Giants for a number one draft pick named Randy White. Three years later, their paths collided in New Orleans. Morton was the Broncos quarterback, while White was an all-pro. It was a tough loss. It was very disappointing. You know, it hurt a lot. That, that really hurt a lot because, you know, uh, you know, the, some of the records I hold are the worst ones in the Super Bowl. I remember one time when my son was little, he was watching ESPN about the game, and he called me at the office and said, Dad, I didn't realize that you'd throw some, so many interceptions in the Super Bowl. I said, that's your daddy. <laughs> Distant Replay is brought to you by Dodge. The more things change, the more things look like the new Dodge. We'll have final thoughts on tonight's game in a minute. If you're not going over for the game, maybe at halftime, want to take a peek, celebrate Mike Piazza's birthday. If he and the Dodgers beat the Phils, they'll be in first because the Rockies lost. Holiday baseball coming up after Prime Monday. We gave Dodge Ram the most powerful overall line of truck engines on the planet. A driver's side airbag. The option of four-wheel anti-lock brakes. A cab designed to set the standard for comfort and room. Then, after we made Ram that good, we made it this bad. The Ram Sport. At America's Truck Stop. The new Dodge. In 1970, Elton's very first song went gold. Then, Rocket Man went gold. Then, 103 of his other songs went gold. And now that he's touring with 38 musicians in a small army of stagehands... And, uh, how will you be paying? Elton's gone gold. Money? These are gold. Oh, oh we'll need 371 wake-up calls. After all, nothing's got the power of gold. Okay, we're back. Our final category is the telephone. Wendy, name this tone. Six buttons. Five. Six button. What is the proper telephone greeting in Japan? Mosh moshi. Uh, That's mosh moshi. Oh, yes. Okay, last chance. What is the most frequently dialed number to save money on collect calls? 1-800-COLLECT. Oh, um, uh, uh. It's 1-800-COLLECT. Uh. Well, we ran out of time, Wendy, but we... Game starts in 20 minutes. Sandy, yeah. Oh, my. Woo! I'm coming. <laughs> what is it? He's looking good. What a game. Let's go. Be a fan, not a
not a fanatic. Look your best in Lee Sport official NFL apparel. Licensed by the NFL, NHL, NBA, and Major League Baseball. Lee Sport, the brand for fans like you. Game time! The Big East title is up for grabs, and the Hokies and Eagles are looking to make a run for it. This week, Virginia Tech welcomes BC to Blacksburg for a Thursday night primetime matchup. The Boston College Eagles versus the Virginia Tech Hokies. Thursday at 8 on ESPN. NFL Prime Monday is brought to you by Dodge. The more things change, the more things look like the new Dodge. Dan Reeves has a great record on opening day or night in the NFL, a record of 25 and 4, as he gets ready for his 30th NFL opener as a coach, assistant coach, and player. Leslie Visser has some final thoughts from the Meadowlands. Leslie. Mike, there is tremendous excitement here from a more confident Dave Brown who learned to slide this week from Steve DeBerg, hoping to avoid another concussion, to the electricity generated by Jerry Jones. If you'll notice, all the Cowboy coaches are wearing generic shirts and brand new Nike sneakers. Stay tuned. This game should be full of fireworks. Mike. Okay, Leslie, we look forward to that and to seeing you on SportsCenter after the game. Dan and Keith at midnight, because it's after our game as well, the Dodgers-Phillies. Joe Montana had retired. But watching uh, uh, Steve Bono yesterday, it, it looked like Joe Montana. Now, that number 13 had a terrific day, and he's waited 10 years for this opportunity to become a starting quarterback. He goes 18 for 23, 278 yards, three touchdowns. Steve Bono can get the job done, Sterling. Well, Jaws, if he was throwing to Shannon Sharp from Denver, of course he can get the job done. <laughs> he had a great game. He played on some bad ankles. But what he did was he made plays when they had to have him. And, Joe, I look for Corey Miller to do the same thing with that speed and giant defense. You know, you guys are all talking about professional football. This has just been a lousy weekend for me. Notre Dame loses to Northwestern. Steve Berline from Notre Dame gets benched. Rick Myers gets benched. Jerome Bettis averages 20 inches a carry. I can't wait for this weekend to get over, Mike. <laughs> Do we need to remind you 17-15 Notre Dame Northwestern score? Thank you very much. Do yeah, we Ricky, need Ricky Waters went to Oh, Notre I forgot Dame. Ricky Waters. Oh, uh, Sterling called Ricky Waters a coward. <laughs> no, did. What a great weekend this has we, been we, for the Irish, huh? We, we can remind Sterling of the South Carolina Let's score. Let's kick this we thing off. We saved Ray Goff's job. Hey, what more can you ask? Let's for? kick this thing off. Let's while suffering